Have you ever been determined to do something? I mean, like really determined. I remember when I was I called to ministry, I knew I had to go to college, so I determined those four years to make it. Luke records that Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He said, I must press on today and tomorrow, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. Jesus was resolute to accomplish God's plan of salvation for you and me, rescuing us from sin and death. Now today we're jumping ahead to fit with today being Palm Sunday. Jesus is determined to go to Jerusalem. He is resolute because he is motivated by love. Now all these years later, I still love how the Japanese version of John 3.16 goes. Uh, without, the, without the grammar. Uh, God gives his one special son, to this point he loved the world. In other words, God loved so much it overflowed into action. Jesus' motivation is all for love. Now we're reading through large segments of Mark's biography. The first half, Jesus served the people through miracles, through deliverance and preaching repentance. And here in the second half, Jesus is the suffering Savior. He's not a political or military Messiah as everyone expected. Now last Sunday we read actually Jesus' very first prophecy that he would go to Jerusalem, die, and be resurrected. Now we're jumping ahead to the third prophetic word that Jesus gave of his future. Uh, we're kind of skipping the second one to fit with, like I said, today being Palm Sunday. So we'll, uh, Mark chapter 10. They were now on the way up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. The disciples were filled with awe, and the people following behind were overwhelmed with fear. Taking the twelve disciples aside, Jesus once more began to describe everything that was about to happen to him. Listen, he said, we're going to go up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and to the teachers of the religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him with a whip, and kill him, but th after three days he will rise again. Now notice, Jesus is leading the way to Jerusalem. He's determined to accomplish his mission. He's walking a few steps ahead of those disciples. Now, these details are new for the first time. The details about Jerusalem, mocking and spitting and scourging him, and that the Romans would be involved. Now, this is important because the Jewish religious leaders will use the Roman system to do their dirty work. Jesus' prophecy about this is so precise that liberal scholars, who don't believe anything, believe that Mark wrote all this after the fact, but they forget that Jesus was well aware of the prophecies of his suffering. For example, Isaiah's prophecy, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. We find that fulfilled in Mark 14. Even as they march towards Jerusalem, the disciples just have no clue. They still don't understand. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us a favor. Well, what is your request, he asked. They replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? Oh, yes, they replied, we are able. Then Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. So Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it must be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. 
For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. So despite the clear teaching that Jesus was giving them, they still failed to see that the Messiah was not a political or a military position. They take Jesus' teaching superficially. Now we see really poor timing here. They bring up their desire for position, for power and authority. Immediately after Jesus says, you know, I'm going to die. Now in ancient time, these were positions of honor. Uh, and just imagine what it was like to have been one of the other ten disciples. Really? They want to share in the messianic glory. If this was pure selfish ambition, this is the way the world works, isn't it? You strive and you position yourself and you grasp after what you want rather than Jesus' example and teaching of selflessly serving others out of love. Now, the word pictures of cup and baptism are different ways of saying suffering and punishment. God's wrath is poured out, and Jesus will be overwhelmed with suffering, and they will indeed drink the cup of suffering and be baptized. But they have no clue what that means as yet. Now, there's a a New Testament scholar called N.T. Wright, and and he points out that Jesus did become king in 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 a way in this time. Consider these enthronement points. Pilate said, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, you have said it. Other translations say yes. Roman soldiers, they dressed him in a purple robe and they wove branches into a crown and put it on his head. Then they saluted him and taunted him. Hail, king of the Jews. And of course there was a sign on the cross. A sign announced the charge against him. It read, the king of the Jews. But instead of two places of honor at his right and left, we have two positions of shame. Mark records, and they crucified him with two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. James and John were completely wrong in their striving for power and position. In fact, they were actually extending the darkness of this world. The, the, Jesus teaches that the world's rulers, what do the world's rulers do? They rule over people while telling them, and they're oppressive while telling them, hey, I'm helping you. But Jesus takes all the evil of this world, draws it onto himself instead of keeping that pain in circulation out there. Rather than a ruling king, Jesus is a servant king. Now, verse 45 is the key to everything. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. In one sentence, he condenses the whole book and gives us the means, the the method of how we are saved. Service. Jesus served God to the point of death. One of the earliest songs of Christianity goes like this. Who, being in the very nature, it doesn't fit with our sense of rhythm, but in the ancient languages it probably did, so... Hang on there. Who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, loving to the point of giving his own life. Ransom. Jesus exchanged his life to release others from sin. Surely, this is Isaiah, he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. A ransom means to exchange something or substitute something of greater or equal value in order to free it. Jesus took your sin, my sin, upon himself and exchanged his life so that you and I may have purity before God. God. The journey continues. Then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. 
A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him. But he only shouted louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, Tell him to come here. So they called the blind man, Cheer up. They said, Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, Go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. Now this is the last miracle recorded in the book of Mark. It is also the only, the second miracle in the second half of the book. Jericho is the final stage. They are only 18 miles away from Jerusalem. They're almost there. And Jesus, or having Bartimaeus cry out, Son of David! Normally Jesus would have said what? Don't tell anybody, right? But he's so close to accomplishing his goal, he he lets it pass. Now what I like about including this story at this point in this segment is that Jesus was not too busy to help him. Here he is about to die for the sins of the whole world. He's got all that weight, all that responsibility on him, and he stops to take care of one man. One concern for this man. He stops, he listens, what do you need? After the healing, Jesus continues. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs it, and, he will, and it will return soon. The two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied outside the door. As they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, what are you doing untying the colt? They said what Jesus had told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him. And others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God! Blessings to the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David! Praise God in the highest! So Jesus came to Jerusalem and went into the temple. After looking around carefully at everything, he left because it was late in the afternoon. Then he returned to Bethany with the twelve disciples. Again, Jesus takes the initiative and leads into Jerusalem. Jesus is careful to fulfill all the prophecies about the Messiah. For example, Zechariah, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You may not know this, but even the father of Israel, Jacob, prophesied, And it's kind of a significant prophecy that the Messiah would untie a colt, thereby releasing the end of, or the beginning of God's plan of salvation for all people. The triumphal entry feels like a parade, a coronation of a king into Jerusalem. Psalm 118 says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and with bows in hand join in the festival procession. It is a kingly entrance. It is not just a military or a political king's entrance. But at that time, neither the crowds nor the disciples really understood what was happening. If they had, the Roman, the Roman overseers would have stepped in and quieted the crowd. Instead, now I know Luke records, Luke records that that the Pharisees complained to the crowds calling out, the king who comes in the name of the Lord, and t- you know, tell your people to be quiet. And, and, and Jesus says, I, I can't, because if, I, if they don't, the stones will cry out, right? Amen. But Mark, he, he recollects it a little different. He says, you know, it's kind of an anticlimax, because no, they get to Jerusalem, everybody shouts, Hosanna, and what happens? They all disperse. 
It's like pff, they disappear. So it wasn't enough of a, an event to, to arouse the attentions of the Roman, but it fulfilled the prophecies that, that, that pointed to the Messiah. And the disciples looked back and went, oh, wow, that was pretty significant. And in fact, Jesus just goes into the temple, looks around, and goes home. Kind of like, what was that? It's late in the day, and it's kind of like the calm before the storm. Jesus would go on and teach every day publicly. You've heard how many times have we talked about, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody. Here he is publicly teaching in Jerusalem's temple until Thursday night. Meanwhile, the religious leaders plot to kill him secretly. Now, last week's conclusion was an affirmation of faith. I had you do, and you guys are so great. You put up with all my creative, wacky ideas. <clears throat> last week, I had you hold on by faith, right? You stood and you declared, I believe. I hold on by faith. Today is something similar. If I could have the worship team come back up. <clears throat> We now can look back and see that James and John were foolish when they said, hey, I want to sit on your right hand or left hand. Look at, I, wanna, I want some of that authority. I want some of the glory of the messianic kingdom to, on me. We, know that, that we now know that was foolish. Later in life, John, the very John who said, I want to sit at your right hand, he realized how foolish it was. He wrote, Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. He finally got it. Took a little, little bit of explaining, and Jesus' very physical example for him to understand, oh, that's what he means. Jesus rode into Jerusalem amid amid the festive shouts of Hosanna. He rode into Jerusalem as a servant Messiah. Mocking him, they would place a crown of thorns on his head. He would lay his life down as a ransom for our salvation. The cross, the cross truly does come before the glorious crown. Now the book of Hebrews paints a picture for us and I'd like to kind of play with this word picture a little bit. Imagine that we are in a great stadium here, you know, like an Olympic stadium, and there's, there's people in the crowds all around us. We're on the playing field, maybe like a marathon runner coming in the final lap. <clears throat> all those in the stands are the heroes of the faith, those who have gone on before us. As we come in, they cheer. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. They shout and they cheer as you and I throw off sin. And run the race. Every day, Satan whispers in our ear, do as you please. Or, I heard this one on a, on a TV show, you are the hero of your own life story. Sadly, we believe that we are rulers of our own destinies. We wrestle to give God complete rulership or authority over our lives Every day we open up our eyes. We must lay our crown at his feet. Like in the book of Revelation, a similar scene where the 24 elders lay their crowns, their authority at Jesus' feet. We are to lay our crowns before him. So I'd like to do something creative today. For the old timers, this is going to be a very unusual altar call. I'll just be right up front here. 
because it's going to be loud. It's going to be joyous because we are coming before the King of Kings and we are going to lay our crowns, our paper crowns before him in order that someday we will receive a crown of righteousness and glory. I want some of you to walk the altar if you feel led to just come on down and uh, like I said, we're going to sing and shout. They're going to play a loud song and we're going to clap. I want you guys to shout and make a lot of noise because it's almost like that triumphal entering into the stadium uh, before the throne of God and then there's going to be a mighty hush and we're going to lay our crowns before him. David wrote, I used to go to the house of God with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Friends, would you stand with me? And if you feel led, just come on down and we're going to lay our, our, our selfishness, we're going to lay our sinfulness at Jesus' feet and say, you can be the ruler of our lives.